Um, so today we're going to ratchet the level of abstraction up a little bit. Um, I've said a couple of times as we've been going through the fundraising game that when political scientists and other social scientists use game theory in their work that we generally don't put specific numbers in our payoffs, okay? That those specific numbers can be helpful because they're very concrete, they're very easy to look at and interpret, but there's always this kind of nagging feeling in the back of our heads of um, a reminder that we just made up those numbers. And as I've said, we make up the numbers in a way that reflects our ideas about what people want, reflects our ideas about the player's order of preference, okay, what's their most preferred outcome to the least preferred outcome, the order of the payoffs should match that, and that they also represent our assumptions about the player's intensity of preference, okay? So if two different payoffs have if two different outcomes have payoffs that are close together numerically, then we think that the player doesn't care a lot about the difference in those payoffs. A difference of one unit of utility might seem small co in comparison to a difference of 10 units of utility. Okay? And this reflects something that we do all the time in ordinary life. We think about, do we care about something a lot? Do we care about something a little when we're negotiating with other people in our lives, that's something that we're frequently trying to communicate to each other. If you're trying to work something out with somebody that you're in a strategic situation with, one of the things you might be trying to communicate about yourself is what issues you're willing to compromise on, what things are really important to you, what your relative intensity of preference is. And at the same time, you're probably trying to figure out those same things with regard to the person you're bargaining with. Do they care a lot about, a little about one facet of an issue? Is there some way where each of you, for example, could get the outcome that you care the most about and give up something that you care the least about? We represent the, those kind of ideas in game theories with our payoff numbers. But again, it seems a little bit hokey to make the kind of assumption that I've been making all along in the fundraising game that the difference between winning and with fundraising and winning without fundraising is these two units that we don't even know what the units would really be, okay? So what I'm going to do now is something much closer to the way game theory is used, both by academics and I think by um, people who use decision science in their day-to-day -day jobs, by people who uh, do strategy in firms, in, um, in the military, in campaigns, um, sometimes in medical settings is another uh, situation where you might have these kind of variable payoffs being used. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, I'm afraid we're still on the fundraising game. This is the, really the last topic I'm going to do with the fundraising game. By the time we get to the next topic, we'll be using a different example. But because the variables introduce an extra level of abstraction, what they're basically allowing us to do is to talk about a whole bunch <coughs> of games at the same time. So we're really we're expanding our analysis to not just be about one particular example that we could imagine, but a whole bunch of possible examples, um, because that's a pretty big leap. I'm going to keep the... Um, specific scenario that we're working with the same. Okay, so it's still same story, incumbent, raise funds, not, challenger, raise funds, not. So same old assumptions about who the players are and what their set of moves are, and the same assumptions as well about the outcomes, okay? So I'm still going to assume that the incumbent wins here, wins here, and wins here. The only way the challenger can win is if the challenger raises funds and the incumbent doesn't. 
What I'm going to change, though, is I'm going to change the payoffs. Okay, so let's just put the new payoffs over here, and I'm going to use variables to represent different aspects of the payoffs. Okay, so how am I going to do that? I'm going to try and use variable names that will remind me of what they stand for. Okay, so V <coughs> sub i is the value to the incumbent of winning the election. Okay, so there's other things that affect the incumbent's payoff. They're out there too, but regardless of what those other things are, did they have to campaign or not? Did his party win the election? Um, are things going well in his family life? Whatever it is, if he wins the election, we add variable VI to his payoff. Okay, so we add this variable to the incumbent's payoff whenever the incumbent wins. And similarly, we're going to let VC represent the value to the challenger of winning. Okay, and I'm going to use this kind of system a lot. You'll find it used throughout social science. The V stands for the value of winning. I'm trying to make that something you can remember. And I'm using the subscripts here to denote that this is sort of the same thing, but applied to different players. Okay, so we often do that. We often use subscripts or, sur or superscripts, little uh, letters or numbers up here or down there to denote differences among related things. If we thought that these were going to be the same or we didn't care about the differences between them, we could eliminate the subscripts. But you might be thinking, well, I think one of the points that you raised last week actually about the game is maybe the incumbent cares more about winning than the challenger would. So by having these subscripts here, what I'm doing is I'm kind of reminding us that these values might be different. Okay, just because the incumbent has a very high value in winning the election, that doesn't have to be true for the challenger and vice versa. Okay. So what else do I need? Well, I need to think about the costs of raising funds. And I'm going to represent those things the same way. C sub i is the cost to the incumbent of raising funds. Okay, And C sub c here is the cost to the challenger raising funds. Okay, so what I'm doing here is a more general form of the table that I put in the same spot on the board, I think it was uh, about a week and a half ago, where I had the payoffs that um, involved 10, 8, 3, and 1, right? Those were my numbers. These are my new assumptions about preferences. And they're less, right now, assumptions than they are definitions. I'm saying that the payoffs in this game are composed of two variables, OK? A variable that represents how much they care about the election, and another variable that represents how um, much they dislike fundraising, OK? The other ass assumption I'm going to make here, or sort of part of the, the rest of the assumptions I'm going to make, is I'm going to assume that all of these variables are positive. I don't have to do it that way. Okay? You may be seeing another way that I could do it that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. But in general, it's easier to assume that all of our variables <coughs> are positive, and then to use negative signs when we put them in the payoffs here. Okay, it's just easier to manage if we keep all our variables in the positive range. Sometimes that won't be reasonable, in which case we wouldn't write down what I'm writing down right now, but in this case, we're going to say that the value of winning the election is greater than zero for i, lowercase i is either the incumbent or the challenger. <coughs> 
Okay, so I'm deliberately introducing some notation that you're going to see in the book, you're going to see in your homework problems, you're going to use in your homework problems. And what I'm doing here in the subscript is, again, I've got this capital V that denotes a similar thing to the incumbent and the challenger. And what I'm saying is, for both of these guys, when lowercase i is either i or c, the value of winning is a positive thing. These guys want to be in office. Okay? So this, this is an assumption here. I just want to draw your attention to this place holder variable here. Okay? So the, this, the lower case i means with this one inequality, we're making a statement about a whole set of values that the placeholder can take. Okay. We'll do it down here too. And Okay, so this I think you guys would probably do on your own and probably do without the level of self-consciousness that I'm uh, using here. The other thing that I'm going to assume here, and I would urge you to do it this way too, it's easier, if you let the costs be represented by a positive variable, but then subtract them from the payoffs. Okay? The alternative would be to say, oh, raising funds is a negative number. Okay, in which case, for example, over here, I'll start to get ahead of myself. I'm going to write it the other way and then write it the way that, that makes more sense. This would be the payoff to the incumbent over here would be VI plus CI if CI is negative, right? If we think about the CI as having the negative sign in it, that's how we would denote it. I'm saying don't do it that way. I'm saying it's easier to think about the cost as a positive number and to say that the payoff to the incumbent here is the value of winning minus the, um, the disutility of raising funds. The reason why it's easier is because it more naturally matches the way we talk about costs in ordinary language. Okay? When we say that something has high costs, what we mean is that those costs are high in absolute value. Okay? That what they take away from our budget or from our utility is a large number. It's easier to do that keeping the variable itself in the positive range and using the uh, nature of the arithmetic that we use to put them together to denote whether it's a, a good thing or a bad thing. Okay? So, don't do it this way. Think about your costs as being represented by positive variables and then subtract them when you combine them with other aspects of the problem. Okay, so we're going to think about these costs also as having positive value for both the incumbent and the challenger. Okay. One other point I think worth making right here, whenever we talk about costs, we're, not, we're talking much more broadly than about monetary costs or costs that would show up on a budget sheet or something like that. Maybe this is part of what we're thinking about, okay? That fundraising for the incumbent and the challenger is truly costly in monetary terms. Um, there's foregone wages, there's money to put on events that could be fundraising, so that monetary costs are part of this, but it's meant to include anything that diminishes their payoffs. Okay, so you don't like fundraising. Part of it is because it takes some of your money, but also because it takes some of your time, because it's a drag, you just don't like it. All of those aspects, all the negative aspects of fundraising are meant to be captured here. Okay, that's going to be true throughout PS30, throughout applications of game theory, that costs are meant to be broadly construed, not just monetary costs. Okay. So, now, let's put them, let's fill out the payoffs in the game using these variables instead of using the numbers. 
Okay. So going down this path in the tree, this is the path where they both raise funds, and um, what happens here, you'll recall, is that the incumbent wins, right? So what is the challenger's payoff in this case? It's got C sub C in it. Is it VC minus C sub C? What about this? Okay, I'm going to put in red here a couple of the other thoughts that were expressed here about the challenger's payoff. Could it be VC minus CC? Could it be VI minus CC? Neither of these are correct. And let's think about why they're not correct. Okay? Can somebody tell me why this one is not correct? Yeah. Because the challenger doesn't win. That's exactly right. Challenger only gets this positive VC when she wins. So sorry, challenger. No VC for you this time. What about this? Is it taking the, the challenger doesn't care about the incumbent's utility. Okay, so this is no. Challenger does not win. This is like, you know, monopoly. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. You don't win. You don't get your VC. Sorry. This is even worse. The challenger is never going to get V sub I. Okay? V I only goes to the incumbent. Okay? If you look over here, the aspects of the payoffs here only belong to one player. Okay, so it's true that the incumbent wins here, and the incumbent gets some value from that. Aside from fundraising, the challenger gets no value from, let me forget the fundraising here, the challenger gets no increment to her utility from the incumbent winning. Yes? How do we know that the challenger doesn't win is your question there? That's a good question. That part is carried over from the game that we've been working with all along. Okay? So let me just use blue as I did before and remind you of the outcomes here. The outcome assumptions are exactly what they've been all along. So here, if they both raise funds, the incumbent wins incumbency advantage. Here, if the incumbent raises funds and the challenger doesn't, well, even more so, the incumbent wins. Incumbency advantage plus a challenger that can't really campaign. Over here, when the incumbent doesn't raise funds, this is the only way that the challenger can win. And then over here, we have kind of the low-profile election. Nobody really tries to win, and it's just all about incumbency advantage. What is, still looking at this set of payoffs over here, what is the value to the challenger of the incumbent winning? I think I heard it kind of over here. Zero. Zero. That number that starts with a Z, right? I'm the challenger. What I care about in this situation is whether I win or not. The incumbent winning doesn't affect my utility. Okay? So I'm emphasizing that over here because that's this question, I think I'll put it up here, is that there is a baseline. Okay? And you need to establish this baseline whenever you're translating a scenario into a game. You needed to do this to do your homework for last week and you'll need to do it again this week and um, all the weeks of this quarter. The baseline here of not winning the election yourself and not fundraising is zero. Okay. Why am I picking zero? Because it's easy. Okay. If I wanted to pick another number, if I wanted to say it's x, the value of the rest of their lives, it is true. I could have this be 
x plus vi minus ci, x minus cc, and I could add x's to all of the payoffs. But since in solving the game and interpreting the game, I'm only looking at differences between payoffs, that baseline from which all of the other payoffs are defined, the value of the baseline is just going to subtract out. Okay? It's going to cancel out across scenarios. OK, so let's fill in the rest of the, um, the payoffs here. What's the incumbent payoff in this scenario? VI minus CI. Very good. Okay. The incumbent utility is not affected by whether the challenger raises funds. I'm just going to clean up some board here while I talk. And just as it was when we set up this game with the numbers, the incumbent's payoff from these two branches is the same. Okay? From the incumbent's point of view, whether the challenger raises funds or not doesn't matter when she raises funds because her fundraising is going to blow the challenger out of the water no matter what. Okay? What's the challenger's payoff over here? Zero. Okay. Coming down here, <coughs> What's the incumbent's payoff here? Zero. Zero. What's the challenger's payoff? BC minus CC. You guys are going to town now. What's the incumbent's payoff over here? I'll get your question in just one second. VI. VI by itself, no fundraising. And what's the challenger's payoff? Zero. Yes. Why isn't the incumbent's negative CI is the question here. I'm going to do the same thing I did before and kind of write in green some other possibilities. Okay, so why not negative CI here? Okay. Because he's not raising funds. Okay, because of this <coughs> over here. So if you'll notice here, on both sides of the, of, on both of the nodes that are associated with this side of the tree, the incumbent does not pay the cost of fundraising, and that's precisely because she decided not to do that. Okay. And no VI here because the incumbent doesn't win. Okay. <coughs> All right, so one thing I want to say about this game, and I'm sort of, I'm saying this now as sort of a pause to see if anybody else wants to ask any more of these why not questions, because those why not questions are extremely helpful, okay? And in general, if you find yourself getting stuck setting up variable payoffs, one of the things is to start asking yourself, okay, well, what could they be? Why would this be wrong? Why would that be wrong? It's something that you can, it's a frame you can use effectively in a study group, okay? To ask each other, why not this? Why not that? And uh, go to town on that. Okay. So while you guys are thinking about that, <coughs> let me draw your attention again to what we have done here. What we now have on the board with these variable payoffs is not just one game. Okay, it's a whole family of games. It's an infinite number of games if you want to think about that because these VI and CI variables, even though we've said that they both have to be positive, there's still an infinite number of values they could take on. Many more values than we need. Strictly speaking, if we want to talk about what one individual game is, it's one individual game corresponds to each set of possible values for the payoffs. Once you change the payoffs, you change the game. Okay, so what we've got up here now is a whole family of games where the payoffs are represented by these variables. Okay, um, I don't think I've yet used the word parameters, but that's almost, in this context, that would be synonymous with the variables. I've, set, I've got parameters in this game that correspond to different specific payoffs, different specific strategic situations. The cool thing is, I'm going to solve this game, 
right now. And in doing so, I'm going to solve that whole family of games. Okay, so we're going to get the equilibrium not only for one set of values, which is what we've done over the last two weeks, but we're going to find out what the equilibrium is for every element of the family of games that's represented here. Okay? All right. So that is what we're going to do now. And I think I'm going to get myself a red marker for solving. That's been my solving color. And one thing that's going to help me in solving a game of variable payoffs, I recommend it to you. You'll see the Dixit and Skeeth do it as well, is I'm going to number my nodes. Okay, this is just node 1, node 2, and node 3. It's just going to help me go through the <coughs> logic here. All right. So in solving the family of games represented here, I use the same rollback procedure. I start at the bottommost row of nodes. I figure out what's going to happen at each of the nodes. I replace that node with its strategic equivalent, and then I go up to the next level until I've figured out what each player's optimal choice at each node is. And then from that, I'll be able to find the equilibrium and the equilibrium path. OK. So if I get to node 2, node 2 is a challenger node, right? So in solving this, I'm going to be looking at the challenger's payoff. If we get to node 2, what is the challenger going to do? Not raise funds. Same as, same as before. The reason why we know this is that <coughs> by assumption, we've said that CC is a positive number, okay? That those costs are really costs. We really don't like fundraising. So given a choice between a baseline of 0 and a negative number, we'd rather have the 0. Okay, zero doesn't sound like much, but at least it's not negative. Okay. So far, looks pretty familiar. Copying the payoff associated with the branch that we expect to be chosen up here. What's this called, guys? It's the strategic equivalent. Okay, so I'm replacing this <laughs> node with its strategic equivalent. Okay. What about over here? What do we think the challenge is going to do? What's, what, what he said is it depends on whether VC is greater than CC. Right? That was exactly what you said, but that was, that was your point. What happens at this node depends on the specific values these variables take. This is different than what happened before. Okay? So to deal with this, we need to think about two possible cases. And this is going to be something you'll have to do whenever you solve, no, maybe not whenever. For most interesting games that you solve with variables, the solution is going to involve <coughs> dividing up those variables into cases. Okay? So this is the way I would sort of proceed from your observation, that what happens here depends. There's two possibilities. At node 3, this is why I want to have the numbers in here, there are two cases. Okay. Case 1 is the case where VC is greater than CC. And case 2 is where VC is less than CC. Okay. For the present, I'm going to ignore the case where they're exactly equal. You might guess that we're not going to be able to say much in the case where they're exactly equal. Okay. So once you define the cases, you just go forward and analyze each case separately. Okay? So suppose we're in case one. Suppose VC is greater than CC. Okay? Then what happens here? 
raise funds. That were in the case that we were in with uh, the gain with numbers. Okay. At node three, challenger should raise funds. The strategic equivalent here is zero VC minus CC. What happens at node one? It depends again. Okay. And what I'm doing here is I'm indenting. Okay, so we're in case one here. I'm just looking at case one. Supposing that VC equals CC, now at node one, there are subcases. Okay? And the subcases are the parallel here. I'm going to use letters to denote the subcases here. Okay, so subcase 1A, it's case 1, so VC is greater than CC. That's what we've been thinking about so far. Subcase 1A is also that VI is greater than CI, but we have to also think about subcase 1B where the opposite is true. Okay, so moving along here, actually I think I'm done with this stuff. If we're in subcase 1A, what happens? At node 1. Subcase 1A. Does it still depend? No. This is the case we've been all along. VI is greater than CI. VI minus CI is a positive number. I'm the incumbent. I like the positive number <coughs> better than zero. So for subcase 1A, incumbent raises funds at node 1 abbreviating here. I hope my abbreviations are clear. The incumbent chooses to raise funds at node 1. Okay, so for one set of cases, for one set of cases in this broad family of games, we know what the full equilibrium is. Okay, for subcase 1A, the rollback equilibrium just emphasizing the equilibrium that we're finding through this rollback process. It's still rollback, even though we're um, using variables here, is that the incumbent raises funds. The challenger does not if the incumbent does and does raise funds if the incumbent does not. Okay? So we're done with subcase one. But we've got loose ends that we have to go back to. We've got this other subcase 1B to think about, and then we've got all of case 2. So we're not done with the whole family of games. Yes? Is there ever a chance to like, buy the cost? Yes. That, that would be possible, right? In this case, what, I, what I'm going to do for the sequential game theory part of it is I'm just going to leave you with we can't predict what's going to happen there. Okay? When we get after the midterm, when we start talking about simultaneous games, the way we'll think about it is that the challenger could make either choice. Okay? The challenger wouldn't have regrets from either choice. I'm thinking here about the case where these two are equal. And that's going to limit our ability to predict what's going to happen here. Okay? So what we're going to focus on in this part of the class, and what you're allowed to do on your homework too, you can play by the same rules that I'm playing by here, is you can ignore what we call these knife edge cases, 
Okay, because kind of the, you sort of hesitated when you asked that question because it's like, gosh, there's so many values that these things can take, and there's just that very one where they're the same. So that one single case where VC is exactly equal to CC, we don't know what's going to happen here. Okay, so it's fine with me if you guys, it's more than fine. What you guys should do is not try to make a prediction about that case. What would be wrong to do would be to say, oh, well, in this case, maybe something else makes the decision. That may be true in reality, but it's not true in the game. Okay, in the game, we just don't know what the challenger is going to do, and we can't get to a unique equilibrium through that process. Okay, so Throughout this part, when we're defining cases, there's going to be that feeling of incompleteness here. There is one case we're not considering, and it's the case that we can't do anything about right now. Okay. Okay. But we can do things about subcase 1B and subcase 2. Okay, so this is, I'm going to, um, <coughs> how am I going to keep my colors nice here? I had been using color to remind you guys, I'd been using the blue color to remind you guys of the outcomes, but I think now you're reminded, you know, what happens there. So I'm erasing that blue because what I want to do now is think about subcase 1B, which is the case, I'm going to remind you of both aspects of the case here since we've kind of gone through one subcase all the way, and now we have to pick up another one partway through. So subcase 1B is, we're in case 1, right? Okay, so it's the case where the challenger cares more about winning the election than they do about avoiding fundraising, and the incumbent feels the opposite, okay? So some case 1B is a burnt out incumbent, okay? Being in office is just not worth the hassle anymore. The happiness I get from being in office is not worth the grind of fundraising. My VI is now less than CI, okay? Because this part is true just as it was above, in subcase 1B, the challenger makes the same choice as in 1A. Okay? Subcase 1B, challenger has a higher value of winning than their dislike for campaigning. So the challenger's choice here is the same. Okay? But now, in subcase 1B, when the incumbent compares VI minus CI to zero, zero is looking pretty good to the incumbent. Okay? In subcase 1B, because of this, because of this inequality, this set of parameter values being our focus, in this case, what the incumbent prefers to do is to not raise funds. You guys with me on that? Okay, subcase 1B, negative number, zero, rather have the zero. The rollback equilibrium is the incumbent does not raise funds. Challenger does not raise funds if the incumbent does, raises funds if not. Okay. So you might be sort of noticing some interesting similarities and differences here between the equilibria associated with different subsets of this family of games. Yes? Does it matter um, when you write the rollback equilibrium, does it matter if you write for the challenger or the incumbent? Um, because if you write for the challenger, Okay, so Lillian, right? Lillian's question is, when we're writing the equilibrium, does it matter what order we write the two actions that compose the challenger strategy? Okay, so this is actually kind of a nice point to recap 
the nature of the challenger strategy, that the challenger's equilibrium strategy has to tell her what to do in both possible cases. Even though we know that only one thing is going to happen within the game, the challenger's strategy has to tell her what to do on and off the equilibrium path. And what Lillian is noticing is that up here, we happen to write the challenger's action that corresponds to the incumbent's equilibrium strategy first. And here we wrote that action second. I would do it this way, OK? I would always write the challenger or any second mover or third mover strategies in the order that the nodes occur going right to left, OK? It worked out here that that order gave us the on the equilibrium path, part of the strategy first, but that was more of a coincidence. Okay? It would be more confusing to be changing the order in which we put the challenger strategies. Now, it wouldn't be a disaster to do it that way because I'm not abbreviating the challenger strategy as fully as I might. I'm actually saying that here the challenger chooses no if the incumbent raises funds. So I do know what node that corresponds to. If I was using the very most abbreviated way, the way that Dixon Skeeth do, it would get confusing to be changing the order there. Okay, so good question. All right. So we've got the rollback equilibrium for subcase 1A, subcase 1B, we've still got case 2 here. Okay, so case one just had these two subcases. We're done with that. Give a blue check for case one. We're done. And we still have case two. Okay. Case two was one where we had to think about what would happen at node three. And actually, since we've spent some time analyzing subcase one, we're diving back down into the game. It's never wrong when you go back to another case to go back through the whole thing. Okay? So in case two, at node two, what's the challenger going to do? Not raise funds, right? Okay? This, what goes on at this node? is completely determined by the fact that minus CC is a worse payoff than zero. Okay? So for all cases, the challenger's choice at this node is the same. Sometimes that will be true. This is the node where now we're in the case where the challenger's value of being in office is less than her value of campaigning. So now in case two, what's the challenger going to do at node three? Not. Right. Okay. okay. So now, I'll just write that. Challenger chooses not at node three. The strategic equivalent is now different. My red strategic equivalent was right for case one, subcase 1A, subcase 1B, wrong for case two. Because in case two, if we get to this path, the strategic equivalent to the incumbent is VI zero. Okay. The strategic equivalent of node two in case two is the same. So we'll um, make this red and green. Doesn't that look pretty? Okay. This is the strategic equivalent to both cases here. Maybe that makes it hard to read. Sorry about that. OK. In case two, what's the incumbent going to do? Not raise funds. Exactly. <coughs> In case two, I'm the incumbent. I can win office even if I don't raise funds because that challenger doesn't care. I've got an unmotivated challenger. I can stay in Washington, work on policy, hang out with um, glamorous beltway bandits, whatever I want to do. I don't need to raise funds. That's what I'd rather do. 
Okay. So in case two, then the incumbent chooses not at one. The rollback equilibrium is incumbent not, challenger not if raise funds, not if not. So now, with the exception of these knife edge cases, okay, the ones where the players are exactly indifferent between um, the value of being in office and not fundraising versus saving the fundraising, except for those rare cases where VI equals CI or VC equals CC, we've got a prediction for what's going to happen. Well, maybe not quite. I should say we've got an equilibrium got the rollback equilibrium for the three possible cases that apply in this game. Okay, so we went from an infinite number of games to three possible things that can happen. That's pretty cool. Okay, collapsing a lot of possibilities into three cases here. And what I want to emphasize is the decisions about how to divide things up into cases <coughs> were revealed to us through the rollback process. Okay, so when we use that rollback process, you might be wondering, well, how do I know what the cases are? Rollback is going to tell you. The way you know is if you're trying to figure out what's going to happen at a node, and whenever the answer is, it depends. Okay, it was my answer from the middle back there. The answer is it depends. What you do is you think about the two cases. Okay, when is it this way? When is it that way? These games with variable payoffs um, are another example of how we can solve complicated problems by dividing them into simple components. Okay? And this is a point in the class where I, I want to remind you of something I said early on. The individual steps, what we're doing at each step is very easy and you shouldn't feel nervous if it seems like, yeah, it's really easy to say that a negative number is less than zero, that each individual step can be trivially easy. What can make game theory hard to learn, what can be challenging, especially for the stage you guys are at right now, is that there's just a lot of steps. Okay? So the rollback process is a one that helps us organize a lot of steps. No individual step is hard. Okay, everybody here can do the individual steps. It's just remembering how to put them all together. Okay, and I think it's not just remembering how to put them all together. It's not being freaked out at how many steps there are. I think what sometimes will happen with people, especially when they get to the point where they're having to do the second division. They've divided things into cases, and oh my god, now we have to do subcases too. When is this going to end? Don't panic. Okay, it's completely normal. Even if we'd gone to another set of subcases and perhaps come up with six possible alternatives, it's okay. It's normal. It's manageable. You're not, I'm not going to let you get to a point where you have, where it's like, you know, the sorcerer's apprentice and you've got subcases coming out of your ears. Okay, you can do a lot with a small number of subcases. Okay, so what I want to do now, let's be back in black here, is think about what the predictions actually are for these subcases. Okay? When I'm looking for the prediction, one of the things I'm looking for is the equilibrium path, right? What do I really think is going to happen? Okay? Well, subcase one is our familiar case, right? Subcase one is <coughs> the case that corresponded to the game with specific numbers that we used before, and the equilibrium path is the red one. It's the one that we found before. In equilibrium, in this case, what we're going to observe is the incumbent fundraising and the challenger not. What's going to be off the equilibrium path, the causal part of subcase one that we don't see, is that if the incumbent hadn't raised funds, the challenger would have. Okay, but that we're, not gonna, we're never going to see that happen. For in case one, here is our equilibrium path. And what I want to do is I want to also circle the equilibrium path 
in the equilibrium here, okay? So the incumbent raising funds and the challenger not here is our equilibrium path. And the prediction is going to be a one-sided campaign incumbent winning. Okay, it's going to be the outcome that motivated this puzzle to begin with. The incumbent raising funds like crazy, walking away with the election, leaving um, bystanders to wonder if all that fundraising was really necessary. Okay, so now let's think about what the equilibrium path and the predicted outcomes are in these other cases here. Okay, <coughs> let's think about the blue case. Okay. Subcase 1B, something that you might notice as you're comparing 1A and 1B, is that notice that in subcases 1A and 1B, the challenger's equilibrium strategy is the same. Okay? See? I didn't even put blue here. This is the action that was optimal for all parameter values, but the blue and the red choices are identical for the challenger. Okay, there's no difference in the challenger's equilibrium strategy in case 1A and 1B. What is different though is the equilibrium path. Okay, the challenger's doing the same thing if we move to subcase 1B, but now because we have a different kind of incumbent, we see different behavior on the part of the challenger. Okay? <coughs> so that, that's an important point. The challenger's strategy is the same here, but what part of the strategy we actually see depends on what the incumbent does first. Okay? So the equilibrium path here is this, an incumbent not raising funds and a challenger raising funds. Okay, so the equilibrium path here is, what's the headline? Vigorous challenge deposes tired incumbent. That's not the catchiest headline, I guess. Hi made a good choice not to go into journalism, but that's what we would see happening, okay? In this case, even though we've got the same challenger that we had in subcase one, here we're seeing the challenger act differently. Not because her preferences are different, but just because her strategic environment is different. The preferences of her opponent are different. Yes? The question is, when um, I ask you on a homework or on the exam what the equilibrium path is, do I want you to write it out like that? And that's, that's a good question. Yes, I want you to write out the equilibrium path in English. Um, it's getting late. I'm being a little bit silly with my uh, vigorous challenge, deposes tired and come. But what I do want you to do, and actually if you if doing it pushes you to be silly, it's okay. I want you to think about what the equilibrium path would look like in reality, okay? If you could kind of get a vivid picture in your mind of <coughs> if the challenger and the incumbent were playing this pair of strategies, what would I be observing? What would be being written about in the newspaper? What would the world look like, okay? So this final part of looking for the equilibrium path thinking about the predicted outcome, this is the step where we are translating our analysis back into ordinary language. We've translated the problem into game theory, we've analyzed it, we've thought about the things that could happen, now let's think about what that's taught us about the real world. Okay. Final case here, the case where the incumbent does not choose to fundraise, and the challenger does not under either circumstances. This is one where the challenger strategy is now different 
than it's been in these other two cases. The thing I was emphasizing about this case was that the challenger's strategy didn't change here. Even though it didn't change, the equilibrium path still changed. Here, the challenger's strategy is different. You might actually observe that the incumbent's equilibrium strategy is the same as it was in subcase 1b. Okay. So the equilibrium path here is the third possible thing that can happen is um, what does this look like? This is happening. What does it look like in, in the world? Doesn't look like much, right? <laughs> no campaign on either side. This is a very uh, low profile election. Lots and lots of elections, I would say, fit this profile. Okay? We just don't see very much campaigning on either side. Nothing really happens. One person wins because of something about her. In this case, it's an incumbency status. Um, many local elections, if you've been involved in um, groups, uh, clubs and things that have to elect offices, um, it's often the case that uh, people don't really value being the you know, president of the marching band enough to campaign or something like that, and that uh, elections involving non-politicians often have this form, okay? and indeed that we might be surprised to find campaigning um, going on. It, the Department of Political Science uh, being uh, elected chair of the department is something you'd be surprised if somebody actually campaigned for that because in general we think that it's not that great a job to begin with and why would you go to the extra work of campaigning? Yes, Elaine? So for the equilibrium path, can we just write like incumbent doesn't raise funds and the challenger doesn't raise funds? We don't need to do something like that where we have to actually interpret the situation? Elaine asks a good question. I'm going to sort of elaborate a little bit on it. Uh, first of all, she's wondering whether in writing out the equilibrium path, we can just say something like, in this case, the incumbent does not raise funds and the challenger does not waste funds. Again, let me emphasize here that that's enough for the equilibrium path because the equilibrium path just wants us to emphasize the part of the challenger strategy that we see played. Okay, so technically speaking, that is the equilibrium path. On your homework, if I say something like, what do you expect to happen? Then what I'm wanting you to do is elaborate a little more. Okay? I'm wanting you to, um, Brandon? To, um, as Brandon was suggesting, uh, think about what it would actually mean. Okay? So that's sort of, that's, I guess that's my code. Equilibrium path has a formulaic solution, the part of each player's equilibrium strategy that we expect to see played. What do you expect to happen? That's kind of your cue to get out of the lingo of game theory and start interpreting. Is there another question around here? Okay. All right. So now let's kind of step back. What we've done, we've done a lot today. We've used these variable payoffs to represent, as I said, this huge family of games, an infinite number of games that are the same in terms of the players, the strategies, and the outcomes, but differ in the payoffs. Okay? For this family of games, we've now solved for the equilibria of all that infinite number of games and that they fall into what's basically been three cases, or the way I wrote it here, two cases that depend on the challenger's payoffs, and one of those cases divides into subcases here. For all the possible infinite number of values that can be represented with this game, there's only three possible things that can happen. Okay, so that's kind of reassuring. And what the analysis has done is it's told us where the, um, where the boundaries are between the cases. What the cases are is something that comes out of the solution 
of the game. How do we know that the difference between case one and case two depends on the relationship between VC and CC? We found that out through the rollback process. We found it out because when we were going through the rollback process, we got to a place where we couldn't solve a node without dividing things up into cases. Okay, so that's how you know. The part of what we get from solving the family of games with variable payoffs is an understanding of what the relevant cases are. Okay? We might, even without knowing game theory, look at this case and look at this scenario, incumbents and challengers raising funds and not, and saying, well, what happens in this interaction is going to depend on how both of the players feel about both winning the election and about fundraising. I think we could get that far with common sense. Um, then we could even get far enough to understand that the relative valuations would matter. But if we want sort of a precise sense of when do we expect to see the one-sided campaigning with the incumbent winning, when do we expect to see challengers overthrowing incumbents, and when do we expect to see the low-profile elections, the process of solving the family of games through rollback gives us that. Another issue that I kind of want to emphasize right now is there are three equilibrium here on the board. But what I want to emphasize is that each individual game has only a single equilibrium. Each individual game that corresponds to a specific value for VC, CC, VI, and CI, each specific game will fall into only one of these cases. Okay? So we have different equilibria for the family of games, but each member of the family has only a single equilibrium. And you might be sort of nonplussed by that remark now, but unfortunately after the midterm, we're going to have to deal with cases where a single game can have more than one equilibrium. That's not happening here. Okay? Another way to think about that is if we know the specific values of VI, CI, CC and VC, as long as they're not in that knife edge case where they're equal, we know what we predict will happen. Okay, we have only one prediction. Okay, we're not going to, once we have numbers associated with the variables, we're going to know which of these cases will occur. That won't happen with simultaneous games. Okay, so that's just looking ahead there. Okay. There's a couple more things I want to say about this. Um, but actually, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to, I've, I've done all the work now. And you guys now have seen me do enough work that you can get right to work on problem. Actually, um, you, could, you could do your whole, whole homework too now if you wanted. If you've got a good weekend coming up, you're equipped to do that whole problem set. I'd actually, even if you. Um, aren't inclined to finish your homework a week early, I would recommend just trying something with the variable payoffs before Thursday, because just trying will enable you to come back on Thursday and um, throw questions at me if it looks a little bit harder when you do it by yourself. Okay? So we'll do that on Thursday, and then we'll get into evaluating outcomes.